So before we dive into the session, I wanted to begin by having our discussants introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about our the background. Peter? Background. I got up last year, but I guess there's a few people here that weren't here last year, so I'll uh, repeat, it, repeat it back again. Uh, my name is Peter Stein. Um, I am a sort of a scientist engineer. I have a doctorate from uh, MIT in Woods Hole Oceanographic and Underwater Acoustics, of all things, sonar system development um, for the Navy, and I've owned a company since uh, 1992. Uh, two and a half, about a little over two and a half years ago, I actually won about a $5 million contract to develop a state-of-the-art system for undersea surveillance. At the same time, I was incredibly stressed and not sleeping. The sleep apnea was rearing its head, and I was completely sleep deprived. I definitely went manic and had a mental episode that uh, took everything off the tracks completely. And uh, two years later, a uh, CPAP machine, it's uh, gotten a lot better. But it really did not start until I actually did get into a car accident uh, at 12.30 in the afternoon uh, driving down the road and uh, almost killing somebody. So that's really the story. But in an interesting turn of events, my cousin Adam here uh, runs the ASAA with his lovely wife, Justine, and a lot of other people. But um, they're instrumental, and Adam's gotten me involved. But not more than that, I've been using the CPAP machine and looking at data and the situation and so forth. And, um, and yeah, there's a lot of issues here that, uh, that need to be brought out and, and brought forward, and uh, that's why I'm here. Thank you. Stacy. Hi, I'm Stacy Tignano, and I, I'm actually a cancer patient. Um, I don't, to the best of my knowledge, have sleep apnea, although that last presentation was um, phenomenal in a, in a really distressing way. Um, but I work with, uh, in the oncology space, helping individuals get their health data um, and then helping them figure out what they can do with that health data. Um, again, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the numbers in the oncology space. We have almost 17 million people living in this country with a cancer diagnosis. Um, I was speaking with Adam a few weeks ago and didn't realize the correlation between sleep disorders and cancer. Um, so, so that was actually quite, quite fascinating. Um, and then again, during our conversation, um, my brother as an infant, he's, he's now a grown adult, um, as an infant was diagnosed with sleep apnea. And so my memory of that was my parents being gone in the middle of the night, rushing him to the hospital time and time again until they finally took out his tonsils and adenoids and apparently solved some of the issues. Um, and then, as I was explaining at, at lunch, my father is, um, was diagnosed with apnea in his uh, 60s, and it took almost 10 full years for him to get to use, uh, or for him to use, his CPAP. So delighted to be here, delighted to, to think about ways that we might be able to help um, the apnea community and, and sleep disorder community that, honestly, I don't know how big it is. Pretty big. Thank you. Hopefully. <laughs> and Will? Uh, Will Ed Hall. Um, I work with the ASAA. I'm on the board. I've uh, been maybe six or seven years doing this. I decided to dedicate my time to doing this after I had a career in Silicon Valley where I worked for a large uh, computer companies and started a couple small computer companies. Um, and uh, at one time, I was a CIO of a Fortune 500 company. Um, but about five or six years ago, I thought I'm going to dedicate myself to this. And I tried to educate myself uh, about why people got sleep apnea. Uh, I had sleep apnea, got diagnosed back in 1995. Um, then I diagnosed my father, my sister, uh, now my son. Uh, and I said, well, I think it's worthwhile trying to figure out how to solve this problem. And of course, something like CPAP is like, um, it's not great. Uh, for some people, it's super great, but you know it has its flaws. Otherwise, 100% of the people who have one would use one. Uh, but one of our board members is fond of saying CPAP is like wearing eyeglasses during the day. You know, two of us here have eyeglasses on, and at night we put our eyeglasses on the on the bed stand, and we put our mask on at night, and it's kind of uh, no different there. Uh, but uh, my interest is to uh, really help. And then we've, uh, in the ASA, we'll, we'll be talking about it. We've had some research studies I participated in. And uh, my hope is that um, the data will become, you know, more and more um, usable and collectible so we can make some bigger decisions about how to treat it better and maybe cure it someday. 
Thank you. Okay, so with that, um, my name is Bray Patrick Lake, and I am a patient advocate who's founded disease advocacy organizations. Um, I'm a cardiac patient, and then I got really more involved in kind of the systems change because I realized that patient groups alone couldn't solve a lot of the national issues related to research. And so I've had a transition. And then recently, I joined up with um, Hoodie Nation. <laughs> so I joined the technology community um, because I realized that really to achieve the full potential in research, uh, we really needed to do this through technology and better ways of understanding a patient's health. This is probably the most important slide in my deck because my perspective is very much rooted in the patient's truth. And so when I work in academia or industry, uh, a lot of people can be incensed um, by what I have to say. But right now, <clears throat> excuse me, I work for Evidation Health and we're a company that finds new ways to measure health in everyday life and I have yet to be fired, which is encouraging. <laughs> so um, let's get down to it. The current research and healthcare system is broken and patients and research participants are over it. What we dream of is precision health that's actually fueled by engaging impactful research that is person-centered, it is efficient, it generates evidence-based prevention strategies, reliable and timely diagnosis, and effective treatment options that are responsive to individual needs, characteristics, and preferences. Yet, what we often have, <coughs> excuse me, pardon me, is this really fractured and disintegrated snapshot of health. Um, in that bottom corner, if you follow me on Twitter, this is my actual longitudinal health record, which is absolutely worthless. I've collected every piece of data on myself, and I have absolutely nothing. Um, and, you know, we, we treat people in, by disease and body part, and it was actually very encouraging. Your multi-stakeholder panel, we're actually looking at patients more holistically and collaborating with experts. That's actually, you know, an exception. We're seeing that in some centers of excellence, but certainly every patient across America doesn't have access to a model like that. And that really leaves us in this place of being viewed unidimensionally. And to me, Flat Stanley is about the best example that I can think of in the way our healthcare experience has been. Um, to continue depressing you, it takes 12 years or longer to actually bring a new treatment to market. And then once we actually get that treatment to patients, there's a primary question that we ask ourselves that is completely unanswerable. So based on my personal characteristics, what can I expect my outcomes to be? We do not know, and that's because therapies are reaching market after we've studied them in the cleanest population possible. And that's really important to you with all these multiple comorbidities that are completely being left out of research. Our research results are often an average, instead of actually understanding which uh, participants in a trial might actually receive benefit and some might receive harm. We average that together, and that's how we evaluate therapies right now. We do what's called a subgroup analysis, and we'll take out these single variables, but again, this is a very complex disease. There is not a single variable that I think would be very encouraging or relevant for this research. And then we fail to understand what's the best timing of treatments? What's the best combination? What's the best sequence when we're starting patients and bringing them on to a new treatment or taking them off? And so what ends up happening is we have very finite uh, research and healthcare resources right now, and we end up basically treating patients who aren't at risk, they actually wouldn't benefit from a treatment, or even worse, we could have present, prevented their disease and we just haven't because we didn't have the right level of evidence. And so now we have this new push related to electronic health records and then insurance claims data, and they call that real world evidence. But what can happen if you just look at, let's say the number of hospital admissions, or you know, when did a patient die? Two patients can look exactly the same from that type of uh, data, and we don't understand which one might have a miserable life and which one might have a high quality life and why that is. And so really it's time for a more integrated and holistic approach to understanding health and disease. And so I really like to think of myself, I am so much more than just my clinical data, just my genetic data. Um, and here, my clinical data is the smallest box. And you know, if you look at understanding my health, I'm embedded in a very dynamic family continuum. I have kids, I have a husband, I drive to hockey practice six days a week when I'm not flying. I live in a community where we have a lot of fracking going on, there can be air pollution. All of these things are drivers of health, and honestly, we're not doing a very good job of understanding that. So I wanna bring you to the concept of precision medicine that you've probably heard over the last few years. And so the definition that was accepted by the National Research Council, which is part of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, 
it is the tailoring of medical treatment to the individual characteristics of each patient. And that's to classify individuals and their subpopulations that differ with what, whether it's susceptibility to disease or a particular response to a treatment. And so I don't know how all of you are feeling about the personalization of your healthcare right now, um, but I'm thinking there's probably room for improvement. And now we're in this new concept that I really encourage all of us to embrace and, and really uh, promote and advocate for, and it's precision health. So it's really about predicting and preventing disease, not just treating it. And so um, Dr. Lloyd Miner, who's the dean at Stanford University, I don't think he was the first person to say this, but I think he said it very well. So medical care and genetics make up about a quarter of the total inputs for a person's health. Social, behavioral, and environmental determinants really dictate the rest. And so with this, we have the power of new technologies to better understand a patient's life outside the clinic, and then we can rely on the big data and machine learning to actually fuel this approach. So in precision health, we basically take all of these cross-cutting areas of a patient's life and we stack them and integrate them. And so um, what this looks like is not only understanding your genomics, but looking at your health records, looking at, um, you know, actually Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded something uh, called Mapping Your Life Expectancy out of um, Virginia Commonwealth University that actually shows that your zip code can be certainly one of the most significant drivers of your health. And if you think about people who live in low-income communities and they could be right next to a highway, they could have poor air quality, they could lack access to transportation, food, all these are important drivers of health that we are completely not doing a great job of capturing. So to change that, we need to take what is currently visible in our clinical encounters and episodic, and we need to reveal what's invisible. And so you can use technology to more passively and continuously collect this data. And that basically, I'm dual tasking in case you guys are wondering, I need some type of applause. <clears throat> um, so it's person-generated health data. And this basically has the potential to help us better understand health and disease, and then also our experience and how we're using medical products. So if you're gonna take a nap, I know it's after lunch, this is the slide to do it. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about kind of some policy issues and some terms that you might hear being thrown around. So um, real world evidence. Um, so the US Food and Drug Administration, who regulates our medical products, they view products and try to determine if they are safe and effective. And basically, there was a push, particularly by the patient groups, to take a more patient-centered approach and use uh, additional sources of evidence, which we call real-world evidence. Real-world evidence is the actual analysis of real-world data. And so real-world data, I see some of you sleeping. I know, maybe you don't sleep well last night, I don't know. Um, but real world data has a number of sources. So there's electronic health records, your insurance claim data. There can be a disease-based registry or a specific product-based registry. But I've bolded um, these two bottom bullet points because I think what's really important and has potential is the patient-generated data that is being collected in home setting. And so this could be a clinical grade device that you take home. Um, and then also what's collected in our mobile devices. Am I getting louder or is it just me? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and so just in case you're ever uh, invited to collect some of this patient-generated health data or share it, um, so responses to questionnaires and surveys, thanks to everybody that took the survey, that will actually be used as evidence that can inform medical product development, care, um, help people understand the unmet need and the burden of disease that you're all living with. You can also have task-based measures, so like a tapping test, if we wanted to see how fast you navigate between screens or tap on your phone, you can actually um, use that to develop what we would call a new type of biomarker. So instead of like a blood test, we can do a digital biomarker that shows um, cognitive impairment in some cases. Active sensor data, so if any of you um, also have the comorbidity of diabetes, you might monitor your glucose. Uh, and that might go through a continuous glucose monitor that can submit this data. You could also have what is a, called a connected scale, where you could get a notification to tap or to step on the scale in your home, and then that data could be pulled through and used potentially in your health record or research. And then there's just passive data that we can collect um, from wearables and apps in a frictionless way. And just think about the power of that. If we weren't having to come into clinics to participate in research, we can actually collect this, um, this data in a much more patient-friendly way. 
So again, in the FDA um, construct, we have uh, the Deputy Center Director for Clinical Science at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, Dr. Robert Temple. Bob Temple, is a, he's a legend at the FDA, and he informs a lot of the clinical trial designs for new drugs. Um, he basically looks at real-world data as what we would call deep phenotyping, so getting to better know patient characteristics, to know who's right for a particular study, who might be in a particular subgroup, who responds, who has more severe disease, who has less, what's the trajectory of somebody's disease when you're newly diagnosed and then you move through these treatments. Um, if you ask me, uh, I really think that this data is much more powerful in helping us better measure and understand how patients feel, function, and survive. And so there's a group at FDA called the Clinical Outcomes Assessment Group that is embracing this new model and hopefully will better understand the patient experience and then we're actively pulling that into clinical trials. So what can this potentially look like? I'm sharing with you what's called a behavior gram from Evidation, where we take what we would call channels, and we take all of your data and we put it into one measure um, of the behavior gram, and we can actually start to correlate uh, some of these different things that are going on. So let's say you have um, an allergy outbreak or an exacerbation of some kind of autoimmune disease, or you have a health event, we can actually look back and we can see, oh, your sleep has been off, your sleep has been off, and then you have a health event. And you can actually look at how does that impact your function? Are you able to think clearly? Are you still exercising? Have you lost weight? Have you gained weight? What's your heart rate? What's your respiration? So all of this data is not currently being captured unless you're in a clinical trial or coming in for a clinical consult, typically. Some, some doctor's offices are using remote monitoring, but in general, it's not real for everybody. And so what we're really trying to do is take the invisible and make it visible. Take things that are subjective. So if we push a survey and we ask you how you feel, that's one measure, but if you actually correlate that with the number of steps a person took or the amount of time a person slept, that becomes objective. And so what we're hoping to do is develop evidence that might be exploratory now, but eventually it'll be hard endpoints in clinical trials, and then we can generate evidence that is not only clinically meaningful, but then meaningful to individuals. So before we dive into our discussion, um, Patient-generated health data really has the potential to unlock these new insights into disease and how patients feel and function. They can impact the clinical trial design and even the recruitment because we can identify who should be participating in this study. We're not going to ask somebody to participate in a sleep apnea study or a comorbidity study if you don't have that comorbidity, and surprisingly, we have a hard time ascertaining that actually now. We can enhance um, knowledge around medical products. So how are patients using them? How beneficial are they? And then we can fuel more patient-centered medical device and uh, drug development. I don't know what happened to drugs. I actually made these slides myself, but I didn't sleep. So anyway, so anyway, patient-generated health data has uh, tremendous potential to make precision health a reality. And with that, we will dive into our discussion. But before we start discussing this, we have um, an audience participation question. So the question. How many of you are um, using, did that, I don't know if it changes up there, we want to know who is using apps and wearables. If you are actively collecting data via some type of wearable device, like a Fitbit or a Garmin, I'm wearing the uh, Vivio Smart 4, not that I'm doing a commercial, but it does do pulse ox too and sleep, which I think is interesting. Um, text in and let us know how many of you are actually using apps and wearables to collect your health data right now. Oh, well, that's good. Didn't I, did I, I thought I wrote that question. That wasn't me. This is all going so well. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I'm worth every penny you pay me. <clears throat> it's a lot. Okay. Oh, it's all or none. You know what? I mean, actually, this is, that's pretty interesting. Well, you have a biased population. You have a lot of people that's in here true, that, very are, that are using yep. CPAP and that are looking at their summary data yep. every night. So that's, I'm not surprised by that. But the difference is, I think, what we have to clarify is the difference between the medical grade data and totally. the consumer data. Because I think a lot of people are misinformed on that. Effect. Yes, and luckily there's a survey open. I know some of you in this room, probably most of you have already taken it, but it will continue to be open. And so we will have um, more hard evidence to share in the future. Okay, so now I'd like to um, turn this over to our panel. 
Um, what do you guys think the opportunities are for using patient-generated health data in sleep apnea? What are you most excited about? What do you see? Are you pointing at me? Anyone. <laughs> There's... Yeah, so um, one of the things that I found being in this disease community and in the patient advocacy community for the last six years is that in the same way that health institutions and research institutions are incredibly siloed, um, which is frustrating and delays progress and delays research, um, so are advocacy groups and disease-based groups. And not because we're not interested in collaborating, but because we just don't know each other are out there. Um, so. I'm just going to share with you a framework that we're working on. How many of you are familiar with the term HIPAA? How many of you know what the P stands for in HIPAA? What does it stand for? Portability. Yes. It stands for portability, not privacy. Mm -hmm. um, the company that I am working with, um, Citizen, spelled incorrectly because we're like that, um, we are leveraging and helping people to understand that they can leverage their HIPAA right of access. Um, HIPAA was put in place almost two decades ago, and yet when many of us try and access our health records, our, our clinical data set, which includes not just our medical records, but also our genetics and our genomics data, our lab results, our imaging, I don't know how many of you have you know, scans on a regular basis, um, and we're told, sorry, we can't share with you because HIPAA, um, they're actually out of compliance. Um, so Citizen's entire mission is to help get the, hand, the data in the hands of the individuals who need it most. We're starting with cancer, so while I'd love to help everybody get their health data, we're actually not ready to do that yet. The point is, we know that that data is incredibly valuable and people can learn a lot from it. When we match that with this patient-generated health data, it becomes even more powerful. And so what we're doing, and, and my role at Citizen is to work with advocacy groups. Advocacy groups, much like yourselves, are setting up registries. Um, these registries are survey-based because that's the best way to kind of pull your population. How many hours of sleep did you get? You know, what do you eat? What's your zip? Like all of these things, all of these questions that they're answering or that you're answering, Again, incredibly valuable, but when you get to the research community where there's a disconnect because the research community says, well, that's really interesting, but because we didn't collect it, we don't necessarily trust it. Um, there's a, a rare cancer called cholangiocarcinoma, and um, there's an advocacy group that, that was founded many years ago, and we're partnering with them to help their individuals get their health data they have an existing registry of 1,300 people, which may not sound like a lot, but it's a huge amount in this particular cancer. And we're not changing anything about what they're doing. They're still going to survey their population. They're still gonna ask all of these valuable questions, but we're gonna help put a clinical backbone to that. So now what we're doing is we're bringing the, the system-generated um, registry data and the patient-generated registry data, and we're putting them together, and we're going forward to research and saying, you have two things that you don't have with just a de-identified registry. One, you have the full complement of clinical data, because as an individual, legally, I can share it with whomever I want. I could put it on a billboard if I thought it would help. Um, and you also have this, this additional information. So from a framework perspective, this is what we were talking about at lunch. It's not all or none. It's not let's get the patient-generated health data and make research look at it. It's we need to bring these things together using the data that they're comfortable with and using the data that we know, um, to, to Bray's point, helps us be seen as a whole person and not just a set of, of symptoms or comorbidities. I think another opportunity is uh, that's, that's the collection of the data and where it's housed, um, and they are siloed, and that's, that's problematic for everybody, including us. I think we're on, on this precipice now where uh, computer systems and the deep learning systems that are coming out of Silicon Valley and, and out of our other places around the world are sophisticated enough now that if we can get that data in the right place and we can collect it, then these systems can actually go through it and look for patterns that, that an individual can't pick out because it's just too big of a problem and groups of people may not be able to pick out. So I think another piece of the puzzle 
is the merging of the incredible computing power that's starting to become available to us. And it's like a, to me it's very exciting because I've always asked the question, you know, how do you, how do you cure sleep apnea? And uh, the answer is, uh, it's a tough one, right? Uh, and what causes it? Well, we, we have general ideas about what caused it, but we don't know maybe on, on a deeper level what might cause it. And so what I'm hoping is that, you know, the ASAs would like to put together a what, well, I don't know if we call it a registry, but you know, uh, the data about each person um, and help come up with cures uh, <coughs> and approaches to new treatment. Uh, and in particular, uh, with uh, 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 Dr. Gimeno, um, he had some, some papers and some theories about how you solve um, sleep apnea and you could cut 50% of the sleep apnea in adult populations out um, of the equation if you just treat children uh, within about three months of their birth. And uh, there's a particular problem where some children have too, um, uh, their frenum is too short, and so the tongue's not long enough, uh, and, and it doesn't push up against the top of their mouths. Well, we've always asked the question, well, how do, how do you know um, which ones to treat, which ones not to treat? If we had something like a uh, registry or database where we could put that kind of information in, then we could say, okay, look at, you know, look at the genetics and over in this piece and merge it together with um, uh, the behavior and merge it together with family history and that kind of stuff. And we might be able to figure out, oh, this is the, this is the common thread uh, that's causing this thing. And if we can identify something like that, that's what we'd like to do in the future, then we'd like to say, well, okay, then, then that means with some studies and some, some clinical studies, that means we could probably eliminate about 50% of the apnea population in the world. It's my turn. <laughs> Say something <laughs> meaningful. Um, so here we have this big data view of medicine, which is, um, from a scientific standpoint, in my, my eyes, absolutely correct. My, my mother would always say to me, says, if you don't know what to do, you don't have enough data yet. Um, more data is better. Um, collecting it subjectively versus, objectively versus subjectively is of course better if you can. And so what I want to do is, so, so I saw that from the, so from the engineering science world and this is from the medicine world. And now I get involved in sleep apnea and so I just want to bring it back down to the sleep apnea world and our data. What's important to us, <laughs> you know, here in the sleep apnea world. And so, you know, as a show of hands, how many people here use a CPAP machine? Okay, a lot. How many people know that there's data collected on your CPAP machine or beamed out to, to space, you know, um, to the doctors? Well, where is the data going? And do you have access to the data? And does the data get stored for research? And the answer to that is no, it doesn't at this particular point. So there's a software package called Sleepyhead that was developed by a guy in Australia, Jedi Mark, he goes by, but, uh, and, and he basically, wanted to see his data, so what did he do? He basically was an engineer, he, and, he, and he unencrypted the, the data and, and got it so he could read it. And that's nuts that the, that the manufacturers and the DMEs are not giving you your data in a form that allows you to be able to read it or to donate it for research because you don't care. So this comes down to sort of this bigger problem of the broken healthcare system, but a definitive example of our end is that if there's the one thing that we need to do here is we need to be able to get this data for research. It's the data that's going to show um, uh, really what an AHI is. I looked at my data based on what I saw on the AHI numbers, and I can tell you that it has no bearing on how well the machine was working for me that night. And, and I look at it and I go, why isn't somebody studying this? And, and it's this... Um, uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a roadblock in the way in terms of being able to actually get at that data and get it out there. And that's one thing that this community needs to solve in a small part, problem to that bigger data picture. Does that make sense? So the manufacturers aren't sharing data with each other or... That's right. The, each, no... each, each of the manufacturers has their own format and their own sensors in their machines. Nothing's standardized. There's and pressure, there's flow, there's incredibly valuable data there. Um, that they're, use, they're using it for product development. Right. Um, their own Some people would say at the expense of, of the patient because the patient may get some benefit down the road in a new product. But there's a, a, there's a question in the community about whether the algorithms in different uh, CPAP machines are better than others. 
or optimized. And optimized, and you don't know. I'm pretty sure the doctors don't know either. And so, but it's black box. I would I would say that um, I know sometimes, especially when you're when you're in the center of the circle as the patient, you kind of feel like things are thrust upon you, and you're kind of stuck in this box. Um, I don't know how many of you um, pay attention. Again, I mentioned HIPAA before, but the Office of Civil Rights, as part of Health and Human Services, just levied its first fine um, against a patient complaint uh, for a roadblocking. Uh, a, a mother a woman asked for the records for her unborn baby, and they did not follow the HIPAA guidelines, and so they just levied a $84,000, $85,000 fine. Um, I'm bringing that up because this is, an, this is a mom, this is an individual, and she was driven, and there is a path forward to speak to those people who control and regulate things like clinical data and devices. And so, unfortunately, at this point, um, devices from a data sharing standpoint and from a HIPAA standpoint, it's not really clear what's, what's available, what falls in, what falls out. Mm -hmm. So again, as a community, but also as a larger people community, as a larger patient community, um, this, is not, this is not just a, a, an apnea community mm -hmm. issue. The, the cardiac community, anybody who's using a, a medical grade device is actually struggling with the same thing. So again, uniting together and there's one clarifying fact that I just want to bring up that we are, as patients, getting summary data from the consumer apps that the device manufacturers had to make because because of the Stark laws, the sleep doctors are not allowed to sell the machines. That put us into a third-party durable medical equipment uh, flow. They, we actually, everyone always says we own our data, but that's one thing to say. It's another thing in reality. When we went and did our overlap the coordinate demonstration product, project, we literally had to connect 330 different patients with 330 DMEs to get their raw data, not their summary data, right. to get the data yep. we really raw wanted data. to look at. Yep. And it, it was a nightmare. And, and these DMEs did not want to give us access to our patients' data, who had already consented. Yeah. See, I, I think of about, there's a decentralized approach, which you mentioned, which is each person should have, be able to get their records in hopefully a format that could be passed on to somebody else. Then you can say, okay, well, I got my CPAP records, I got my, my uh, 23andMe record, and I got these three other things, and someone's asking me to be a participant uh, in a research project. I'm like, bing, 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 here's my, here's my format, and you can now have permission to study it and um, have clinicians look at it and come up with uh, better ideas. So I, I think it's a kind of two-pronged two approach. One is like, you bring all these big data sets together, it's like, oh, that sounds hard, right? Or you say, you know, everyone, you know, take, take responsibility who wants to make a difference and get the portable data so that then they can pass it along to the right groups that they want to pass it along to. Yeah, I'm, I'm very healthy right now, knock on wood. Um, and I know that as a, as a healthcare ecosystem, um, we're trying to move towards interoperability. But I really do believe that interoperability will happen well after I'm dead. Um, <laughs> There are too many egos, there are too many empires, and there's, frankly, a hell of a lot of money wrapped up in our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten fired yet either. No, right? no you don't. <laughs> this is great. Um, and so we can all drive towards interoperability because I think it's probably the right thing to do and there's momentum there, but we can have portability now. Um, and then we, again, I don't know how each of you feel, but I know that in the disease community, typically, um, we feel like there's not a lot of control, and so we try to control what we can control. Um, if we control our own data and we get to choose who we want to share it with, what organizations we feel are doing that deep learning that's going to come up with that next treatment, that better treatment, or the C word, a cure, um, it, it's incredibly empowering, and I, and I think it's real. I, I don't think it's a pipe dream, no pun intended. What's uh, <laughs> let, me, let me ask yeah. you a question on that. So, like, what is a, a format that you know is available today, or do we have to invent the format for the personal records? Um, so there is there are records kept in all different. Um, forms and formats. And so when we grab data from individuals or 
you know, individuals send data to kind of store in, in their citizen profile. Um, we take it hopefully in electronic format, although if it's sent to us in paper format, we scan it in. So we actually have a machine learning component that's going through, it's a combination of OCR, but it's also, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with codes, you know, ICD codes and SNOMED codes and things like that. Um, we, we're trying to play with the taxonomy that exists um, in order to kind of get to sameness. And so we're not gonna drive interoperability, but what we are gonna do is kind of bring all of that data in and, and give it um, a structure so that it can be computable by, by other groups. It needs a structure and it needs to be cleaned from what we've seen from a lot of the raw data through the sleep health study, yeah. what we're seeing with the passive data from the consumer apps, wearables. And, and honestly, that it's not just a wearables or, or a device problem. When you have a health record, different doctors call different things. You know, you can have a heart attack or you can have a myocardial infraction. Um, it's the same thing, but obviously we have to teach systems to recognize those things as, as the same. And, and I think the other key point to the, the AI, AI conversation that's so prevalent, since we were the first research kit connected to the IBM Watson Health, is that it's one thing to have AI and what we all think it is. We still need the human input to design the question, to design the product, to design the device. More importantly, to ask the question. Yeah. So healthcare is the only industry in the world that doesn't bring the end user in to the beginning of the conversation, to the design. And that is sort of one of the, I think, the key things, especially with sleep, where sleep deprivation in, 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 in med school, that was your badge of honor. How much could you do on as little sleep? So breaking that mentality in itself is, is a humongous effort that we're pushing up that 800-pound boulder. We're pushing it uphill right now. Because it's it's the it's the younger doctors that hopefully are starting to appreciate. Hey, if I get my sleep, I'm going to make less errors, and I'm going to take better better care of my patients, and they're going to have better outcomes. The the irony in all of that is, I think healthcare recognizes that sleep is critically important. Right? We hear eight hours of sleep. We hear all of the developmental stages and how you know how much sleep you need. Um, we are, we call ourselves or we say that we exist within a healthcare system, but we are in an illness-based system. We are not a wellness preservation system. And so again, just being here for a few hours, I'm, I'm realizing how core this group is to so many other communities that are affected by disease, because ultimately that's what we tell every disease community. You know, you need to, you need to take your medicine, you need to eat right, you need to get exercise, and you need to sleep. Um, and if you start to take some of those pillars out, we're, we're in the same mess that we're in right now. Yeah, so I, I, I'll absolutely agree after hearing from both of you. This, this group is in the, is, has all the, all the elements of the problem exist here. And, and I'll go back to it. I would suggest that the CPAP data is a magnification of that because that is such incredibly useful data to study along with all the other objective, uh, subjective input somebody might give you in the survey and so forth, that it's unbelievable that you're not, that the, that the researchers don't have access to all of that data, you know? And so there's a really strong example of the problem. And then, of course, you can wrap, you know, you're younger than I am, and you're saying, this problem's not gonna get solved in my lifetime. That's a little depressing for us older people, but, you know, again, you bring politics Just the interoperability the piece. Portability is gonna take right. us home. <laughs> and the, yeah, the interoperability piece is huge, is being able to collect it all simultaneously and use it together, and it's true. So, um, you know, how do we fix it? You know, it's not a, it's a, it's a great question, and then nobody's going to have an answer in this room, but how the heck do we fix this? That's a great segue. So does anybody have an answer in this room? Or a question, <laughs> if you don't have an answer. Anyone? There's an answer. Lost. We've lost our microphone runner. There you go. Actually, I have a question. Uh, I, I mean, uh, it's a, well, a comment or, or a question. Well, you tell me. <laughs> um, what about trying to create an open source standard for interchange of data between the different uh, branches of, uh, of medicine? I have no idea how, you know, when, when you're talking about collecting that data, mm -hmm. you're collecting different data depending on different uh, diseases, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to create some kind of, uh, you know, open source uh, uh, template that would allow everybody to use it. 
So some, that's called a common data model. And honestly, it's a little screwed up that we have to go back and do this right. retroactively because we don't have one health system. We don't have one health record. Um, there's a bunch of different individual vendors that had their own models. And now they're essentially, you know, we're, we're trying to get, um, get all the records talking to each other. And that's what we call interoperability. But mm -hmm. it has been painfully slow. Um, some of the large scale initiatives in this country uh, like the Precision Medicine Initiative, now All of Us Research Program, which is uh, one million different Americans participating in research, that was the foundation. And it's really not a reality yet. So we have, we have a lot of work to do. DOD actually does it pretty well. Um, the the point that they spend a lot of money on it. <laughs> DOD, the Department, the Department of Defense. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Okay. laughs> Who else has an idea? A solution? Sure. How might we? Uh, why? Okay. Yeah, I just want to mention um, Apple uh, back in iOS 11 developed the Fast Health Interoperability Record, which is phenomenal. And if you all have an iPhone, go to Health, mm -hmm. and you can add in hundreds of institutions have agreed to these standards. I just wonder why that hasn't been mentioned yet, because I think it's groundbreaking. And I've got all my Stanford records right here. Um, and there are literally hundreds and hundreds of UCSF is in there. You basically just go in, sign in, and all your records are now in your iPhone in a very easy to use, approachable way for individuals to use. If you haven't gone in to the health app on your iPhone, do it today and go, and go to the account and then add your records from any of the institutions that are on there. And again, Stanford is in there, for example. So yeah. I, I just want to address that. I think that's a brilliant idea, and I think that there's a lot of advocacy groups that are working on that. Um, full disclosure, um, Anil Sethi, who is the founder of Citizen, was actually the founder of a company called Glimpse. Mm -hmm. um, Glimpse was purchased by Apple, and that's the technology that you're actually using. Um, one of the things to know about that, and probably I know it's a big deal in the oncology community, and I'm sure it's a big, bigger deal um, with, the, with the sleep disorders community, is 850 organizations feels like a lot, um, but it's, it's not. It's, and there are so many individuals in this country that don't have the benefit of being treated at an academic uh, medical facility, a large facility that has bought into that. So we still absolutely need to solve the problem of how do those people participate and how do those people get access to, to the additional knowledge. The other thing to note is what you're pulling in, incredibly valuable, that is the, the clinical data, but it's also portal data. So if you're interested, um, your entire health record is actually available to you as well, but it's usually a different request process. So I think it's kind of a both and. Um, I, if, if it's available to you, do it, um, but also know that there's a lot more data out there on you. Right, but if we could get all the institutions to agree to this standard, wouldn't that be wonderful? It, it, it would be. There are still some people that are working in paper. I, yeah. No joke. <laughs> yeah. Working in paper and working in fax machines. But I, but I would say there's one extra thing to, to what Dr. Borelli just mentioned, and is that not everyone has an app or an iOS. Yep. And that's one of the things that we want to see going forward with our Sleep Health app is not just the iOS version, but 75% of the world is on the Android platform. Right. And yeah. One of the other, uh, sort of a question on this, is I'm sort of a, a intrigued by uh, the passive nature in it. I do consumer marketing and there's always the flaw because you're getting data of the person who's motivated and loves to fill out surveys. Mm -hmm. So I think it's critical that we do it in such a way that it's not sort of big brother, but how do we get it so that you're getting everybody's data, you're not getting those who are motivated to answer your questions. Yeah. So I'll just, I'll speak to Evadition. Um, in our community of three and a half million, we individually consent people and ask, but I think you also have to acknowledge it's a connected population, right? And so as technology um, comes more into play, we really have a lot of work to do on health disparities and making sure, like a lot of these AI um, algorithms that I just, I wanna be um, just honest about. I feel like some of the data sets in the cancer world they were primarily Caucasian. 
And you see them in the major cities of the US as like who contributed data because it came from the academic health centers. And then you look at like the rural US and so you'll see nobody kind of like in the Midwest and then there's like Utah and Denver and then there's an outline of the outside. And so while it's a new day, we still have a lot of work to do to make sure that precision health is reality for everybody in this country. So. I, I will say too, again, pulling from the cancer space, which I hate bringing up all the time, but um, we have the same problem with all of our clinical trials. They're very white, they're very middle, upper middle class. Um, we've actually figured out finally that we need to go where the people are, into the communities. Um, you know, California, we have a, the Central Valley is a very different population than San Francisco or LA. And for me to walk into the Central Valley and be like, hey, you get your health records. This is, there's a lot of things, not the least of which is immigration, um, that people are talking about and probably even more concerned about than their health. So it's going to those community leaders and saying, hey, we have this, we'd love to support your community. Tell us how, how we can help. Um, it's going into Oakland, there's the um, Catholic uh, diocese there, and they are starting to do um, faith-based health education. Um, so going into the churches, going into these, these community centers, I think it's a great opportunity for any advocacy group to go in and say, we know this affects your population, it might not be your top concern, but how can we, how can we help meet, meet the needs and, and make it a symbiotic relationship? And the caveat to that is, is who the messenger is. It can't be the doctor in the white lab coat, especially in the African-American community because of past history in this country, and same with the Latin, yep. Latino community and so forth and so yep. on. So it's, it's who's so, given the message. That's why we're doing an event like today, not just for the people in this room, but for our patients that we know can never be here, that they can learn about this because, you know, once they do get empowered and they start to take care of themselves, then they can help, they can go back to their community, the barbershop, the church, wherever, and, and share their experience. So for every one person that we all here help save today, hopefully that person is gonna go and save 10 more. Uh, we just need to speed it up. I, I'm gonna just offer a couple things. Uh, back on the bias, um, uh, in addition to, um, you know, uh, Caucasian people filling out the surveys and that kind of thing, you also have Caucasians uh, writing the, uh, writing the AI programs, right, mm -hmm. with their bias. It's, it's called the bias tribe. And uh, it's something to keep in mind. I was gonna also bring the conversation back to, you know, what can we do? Because uh, I've been doing this for a while now and I'm sort of thinking that, you know, the, there's a model when I first started working at Apple, which was they made sure that the, this was a product marketing thing, but it kind of worked. They made sure that the elementary schools and the, and the middle schools and that kind of stuff had Apple products early uh, and often because they knew that eventually they'd grow up and become consumers. And in this, in this conversation, there's, there's a lot about trying to treat people like myself um, and maybe younger people than me, and that's really important. But when you have limited resources, you have to kind of ask the question, you know, what, what can you make the biggest impact with? And my personal feeling is the biggest impact you can make is to prevent uh, these things from happening uh, at birth um, and focus on that type of thing because in another 15 years or 20 years, that child will be an adult. Um, and and uh, it's not that long. And we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to help people uh, in, the, in the general community. And I think it's kind of time for um, a lot of people to try to focus on what about my child? What about my, my uh, grandchild? Or what about you know, my, my sister's grandchild? That kind of thing. Because, you know, frankly, the thing that frustrates me is I knew about sleep apnea and I had a two-year-old that had a problem. So I went to the doctor, they took his adenoids out, and then I thought, oh, that's over. You know, I didn't think about um, really what his problem was going to be later as an adult. Uh, Adam, on the other hand, you know, got, got on top of it, got thinking about it, and he's been actively working with his child. And I think that's a really interesting place to go where you start working with the, the pediatric community and trying to cut it out early or mitigate it. Um, so that people don't have to wait 20 years and have cognitive dysfunction and, and you know, suicidal thoughts and that kind of thing. So I just thought I'd offer that out as a, another alternative. Thank you. And I'm going to take that as your wrap-up thought. Yeah. And then Stacy, if you're going to leave us with one thing that we could all be doing or that you think is important for the community to do, 
What's your closing thought? Um, I, I mean, you are all here in this room, so I have a feeling you, you kind of walk around and feel like you're kind of empowered and your voice is, is, is valid and, and can be heard. Um, I would just encourage you to take that back out to your communities um, to help empower others. I mean, the system is broken, but it is the system we have. And a brilliant man just said to me the other day, Stacy. A Danish baker says, you have to bake bread with the flour at hand. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to leave you with. <laughs> I'll leave you with just the fact that what I learned is that, um, um, you know, how prevalent sleep apnea is in our society. And I think we all in this room think that. We all think that it's a much bigger problem than people recognize, that it's an unsolved problem. And the only way that we're going to sort of prove it to everybody and solve the problem was to get out there and, and, and talk about it and collect data and to show it. So that's what I'll leave you with. And I'll leave you with uh, continue answering those surveys, participate in research when you have a chance, and I guess work on, as a community, how you're all going to aggregate your data and then use it to improve uh, research and care. So thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, panel.